quite uh, amazing group of uh, speakers, uh, topics, and um, I think challenges that we face ahead of us. Uh, I have been given the, the difficult task of following that clip. Uh, I seem to Im I embody the, the management uh, uh, person there maybe 20 years down the line. But I hope not, uh, and I hope uh, this little uh, introduction will show you how we try to do things slightly differently at our group and um, what we see is, uh, as our role to be. Um, I'll be talking today about uh, a shift in um, opportunities. Um, it, it's the start of a, a varied number of talks you're going to have on different shifts that we see occurring in the education space. Uh, in front of you is just a small breakup of how I'm going to proceed today. It's uh, just the first part would be an acknowledgement of the shift that we talk about and try and define that shift, um, leveraging the leaders that we have. Um, again, my talk will be more specifically about strategies, successes, and failures that we've had at uh, the Podar group of schools. Uh, but knowing that people in the audience here uh, are from varied backgrounds, um, maybe from um, NGOs, third parties, uh, single, single school networks, or a group of schools. Um, I'd, I'd try and keep my, uh, my examples and my uh, talk in a, in a general way where you can relate these back to your organization going back. Um, the third part is student innovation. Um, again, when we talk about creating a culture of innovation, it's not just um, for the people sitting in this room, but how does it percolate down to, at the student level? Of course, uh, it ending with a few takeaways on achieving scale and success. Uh, as again, uh, referencing back to Mr. Khan this morning, when I say scale, I mean qualitative growth and not quantitative growth. Uh, I had a word with him again. Uh, but, and getting started is how, uh, a few takeaways of how we can end this talk and what we can do to get the ball rolling. Um, facilitating innovation. What is the shift that we talk about? Um, I'll just start by talking about, in general, uh, this educational ecosystem that we have and which is represented here in this room. Uh, it goes all the way from um, management of private schools to working with uh, government schools across India to working as uh, uh, professional development courses, uh, software, uh, third-party services, coaching classes. Uh, but all of these uh, players within the segment, whether you are a software developer or uh, someone who teaches a theater in the school ecosystem. Uh, I would put together into this uh, term of the educational ecosystem. And when we talk about innovation, we talk about it, um, it the, the need for it across all levels of this ecosystem. Um, the responsibilities that we traditionally embody, I mean, the school, as when we started uh, our first campuses in Mumbai and then subsequently across uh, the state. Uh, I still remember the first uh, responsibility that as management and the first responsibility we gave our principals was student achievement. And student achievement defined in a very narrow sense of uh, class 10 or class 12 results. Uh, and that is what, it still, it still exists. It still exists across the network, it still exists across schools in India. Uh, but I would argue that over the last five to six years, there's been a growing uh, concern, a growing awareness of the responsibilities and that shift in what education defines for our students and for ourselves. Uh, and again, going back to what uh, Mr. Khan started as keynote speaker, is uh, we may already be behind the eight ball, we may already be behind that curve, but it's never too late to start thinking about uh, the responsibilities that we need to inculcate in our students. And we have our students here today. We have the 11 standard, 12 standard students here. But more than that, it's, it, it's a culture that we try and embody. Uh, and what are the foundations of this, this change in responsibilities? Uh, again, taking off of what Mr. Ronan uh, said before the break, was uh, creativity. I mean, that's the first thing you think of when you think of innovation as a group. Uh, if someone asked me what does, what does innovation look like, you'd say it looks like creativity. Um, but that, ha that, I would say, is a, an incomplete uh, profile of innovation as a whole. 
Uh, with creativity, again, uh, touching back to what we discussed earlier, was courage. Uh, courage on both ends. Courage to, uh, to create that space for innovation. Courage to accept failure or success. Or what's even scarier is neither of the two. You don't know yet whether it's a success or a failure. You're just innovating. Uh, and of course, initiative. Uh, initiative here, uh, I would argue, is the third wheel which actually puts what we talk about, whether in this forum, whether in LSIs over the last two years, or in future forums that you may go to, is what do you, how do you take what you've learned, how do you take this eight hours of today, and what initiative do you go back and spread to your teams? Whether it's directly with your teams, whether it's with your students, whether it's in your working uh, day, in your daily life. But I would, I, what we believe in our system is, unless you have a, a bit of all three, uh, the framework for innovation or the, the cultivation of innovation is incomplete. Um, this logically leads to the second part is, how do you, you start the initiative? How do you start innovation actually in practice? Um, and whether you have a, an organization of 20 people or 5,000 people, uh, it starts with not, uh, not the, the head, but uh, the people below you. Uh, the people who are empowered, the people who have a focus on the students, on the end uh, users. Uh, so here again, when I say empowered, we believe very strongly that it goes along with accountability. So we, empower, we like to believe that we empower our leaders, but you have to hold them accountable. Um, innovation has to be um, student-focused. Uh, a lot of times we experience innovation for the sake of innovation. You experience innovation because it's the buzzword. You in experience innovation because it's what everyone around you is doing. But it has to be student-focused. Thirdly, and this is, I believe, the most important one, is it has to be data-driven. Um, innovation has to be, in some level, uh, monitored, uh, encouraged, but at the base of it, it has to show uh, value addition where you want it to be value-added. And of course, aligning incentives. Uh, again, it, it speaks for across the organization, but incentivizing students to innovate all the way up to incentivizing management. And when I say incentivize, I don't mean a monetary or a, or a tangible incentive per se, but even exposing the people to what are the long-term benefits of this. Um, that is aligning incentives. Student innovation. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll go through a stu few things that we believe uh, are a prerequisite to making that possible in, in an Indian context. One is breaking free of um, our traditional um, boundaries that we have with regard to our, our syllabus, our, our result focus, our desire to go to IIT, IIM only. Um, again, it's easier said than done, but I would argue that if you look at a Podar school across, across India, we don't do CBSC the best. We, we are not schools that only say that we will teach CCE the best, we will teach our syllabus the best, we will have students who uh, excel only at uh, uh, centralized exams. Uh, we like to believe that uh, we, we, we would break free of those traditional constraints and give an opportunity to people to uh, bring in learnings from different uh, syllabi, from different experiences. Uh, controlled chaos, that's one of the hardest things for uh, principals, teachers, uh, to actually embrace. But uh, innovation a lot of the times looks like chaos. I would only, being uh, from the management and an MBA, I would say, make sure the chaos is controlled. Uh, have frameworks across that chaos. But be comfortable around that. Uh, demonstrate relevance. Uh, we've tried to speak to a lot of our students and saying, yes, we've given you the tools, we've given you the space, but uh, how do you encourage that, that innovation? And the students always came back to us with two things. Demonstrate relevance to us and give us an opportunity to showcase it. Let us stand behind our innovation and let us present to the world. And forums like these, forums within the school community, forums just with parents or just with their peers, 
But if you can de demonstrate relevance to the innovation and give them a showcase, whether it's through video, audio, standing in front of a stage, uh, but through theater, but demonstrate some kind of relevance and give them an opportunity, you'll be surprised with the results you get. Of course, I'll just end with uh, a few things on uh, success and especially scalable success, because what you're looking for is long-term scalable success. Um, proof of concept, uh, definitely what we found is to get momentum into the organization, you need to show the proof of concept. You need to show why this works, how it works, and believe me, you will have people who will then voluntarily take on this, this challenge of innovation. Um, that comes into momentum. Momentum not at our level, not at leaders sitting in a conference once a year. Momentum at the, at the base level. Uh, celebrate incremental change. We have a, a, a term in the office with, in, in the thing. It's, we're not looking for the next big thing anymore. It's been done. There, there are too many next big things. We want incremental small steps. And we celebrate each step that we take. We celebrate them through recognition, uh, through practice, through giving more resources. But uh, look for incremental change. A lot of the times, innovation is correlated to this next big game changer. And of course, iterate. Uh, when I say iterate, I mean we believe that both success and failure are both temporary in innovation. If you succeed at innovation, you're just succeeding for a short period of time. You have to go back to it and build on it further. And the same with failure. So keep iterating on it. Keep, there's always going to be a version 2.0, 3.0, and so on. Um, just to end the talk, and uh, I mean, I gave you a, a bird's eye, uh, 50,000 feet view on it. But how do you get started on it? I'd say you start by just a small little innovation that you can do at the student level. Uh, what we've done in some of our schools is uh, we've gone in there, not even taken the entire class. If there's a class of 35, 40 students, you take in just two students or five students who are having difficulty in a certain area, a, diff uh, a subject, uh, uh, or not even difficulty. They are showing some kind of creative spark. Go in there and encourage that student or that those two students. If you're not running a school, go in there at your individual level and give that individual the opportunity. If it works at that individual level, if you learn something from there, go to the next one, which is the group level. If you can prove it for one student, it's, it's a different challenging, uh, different proposition proving it for 40 students. Go in there and try and prove it for 40 students over six months. Then I would say take it at the school level. Uh, again, if it's not in the school context, take it at a functional unit level, whether you have a single office, whether you have a department somewhere, whether you have um, you know, a single team uh, that, is, that is showing this promise. Let's see if they can do it across a geography. Let's see if they can do it across time. And only then would I say uh, look to scale up across board because by this time, believe me, the other 75% already have heard about it and they really, really want to do it. So if you, if you prove the first three steps, the last part is by far the easiest. Um, it's, it, it's, a, it's a snowball effect that always takes uh, precedent. So uh, a simple roadmap, I would say, is something that we have tried to follow. Um, we've tried to follow whether it is academic innovation, whether it is... Uh, uh, communication innovations, whether it is on the media side, whether it's on the digital side, or on the, on the pure uh, paper and pen uh, teaching side. But uh, across the network, across your business, across your scope of uh, operations, I would argue that this is, 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 is one of the roadmaps that you could use to spread it. Um, again, um, specifics on innovations, we could always, I think, uh, Beer ma'am and the rest of the team will talk about as the day goes on. But um, as a whole, as looking at it from leaders of your organizations, uh, these are a few of the takeaways that I would say is a way to get innovation started. Uh, of course, uh, I'm, we are open to questions. I know I've overrun slightly, so we have a few minutes on questions. Of course, I'm here for the rest of the day. 
uh, our website's on there and my personal email address. Uh, please feel free to connect at any point. Uh, but I'd like to just throw it open for a few questions that we have uh, at the forum level. And of course, uh, you can catch me at lunch or any time, and we can discuss it in more detail. So a couple of questions have come up on today's meet as well. If they, the people who have posted want to ask those in person, you can do that, or we could pose it to Mr. Gaurav. So one of the questions is, how do incentives work in right. the school system? Nitya has asked. Uh, oh. Yes. So would you like to respond to that? We don't really work with incentives at all. I mean, it's about doing the best you can because it is the best thing to do. So how do you uh, work this out in an education fair. system? It's yeah. a fair point, ma'am. And I think we struggled on that for three to four years. Uh, we almost went slightly behind that question is, before you incentivize, uh, like you said, a lot of teachers and, and people in the school system believe that uh, there is very little quantifiable data or something to use to incentivize a group, especially when you're talking about innovation or creativity. Um, in such a case, um, A is what we do is we have, as a group, we have uh, now four to five showcases a year across our network. This is a student and teacher focus uh, showcases where each school or each group is encouraged to come in and showcase what they have done in their schools. Uh, to their peer group, uh, to uh, the management group, and to the outside parent community as well. Uh, so I th we felt that recognition for the good work done is, is a large incentive by itself. Uh, secondly, uh, we don't, we're not touching upon monetary incentives as a, uh, as, a, uh, as a real driving force in this case. But uh, the other thing we looked upon as uh, incentives uh, to drive innovation is really encouraging um, is really building that base on the why behind it. So uh, we would go in there and argue that uh, a l there's a lot of uh, resistance to change. There's a resistance to bring about, uh, maybe it's a new software that you feel is replacing something. Maybe it's a new uh, a way of teaching. Maybe it's a new professional development course that they don't find the relevance to. So giving that kind of uh, relevance and answering the why really brought about uh, a lot of uh, self-motivation in that sense. And of course, the third big chunk uh, is um, purely in terms of material or monetary incentives. So we have uh, systems that we do every year, uh, annual, where we give uh, increased uh, resources to schools. We give more, uh, uh, we give staff incentives. We give uh, uh, outside thinking time to teams that they then we give um, uh, outside school, you know, um, picnics and uh, re resort time where they then talk about these things and then uh, go in there and build it. So I think we try to hit upon incentives on both the uh, monetary as well as non-monetary side of it. I think uh, Billy Broad had posted a question as well about, shall I read out the same one? Will you please share with the group? I've been thinking and it's, uh, I understand where you're coming from, uh, but just to reflect is uh, how do I really look at so when I look at innovation and invention, I'm saying in, the difference between invention and innovation is the number of people that adopt it. Uh, only when enough number of people have adopted it, it becomes an innovation. Uh, that's the way I'm looking at it. Uh, which means then we're driving, fundamentally we're driving within our schools, we're driving invention. We're saying let's do this differently, 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 differently. Now the two things that come to my mind, one, yes, we should be fundamentally thinking of doing things differently. Uh, but not at the cost and sake of differentiation. That's the first thing, and I guess that's what you mean by addressing the why of it. Uh, but the second thing is initiative fatigue. I mean, as an organization, do we, do we start, you know, really getting tired of just doing things differently all the time? That's the first thing. And the second thing I'm just so wondering could is... Could I what? interrupt before there's a third question? I, I lose track of the first one. So the, <laughs> that's the called mission drift. <laughs> so the first question, and I completely agree with you, is uh, are you just then doing... Um, are you looking at, uh, sorry, again, I lost track of it. Invention, innovation, and the question was it specifically? Yeah, the, the, the question is then with our focus on doing things differently, right. then there's initiative fatigue, right? Because I need to try no. everybody who comes, I need to see that, and then my team is probably looking at me and saying, is there mission drift, you know? Is, I completely agree. So what That's what I'm to, suffering with. Uh, right? So we have uh, a, a very strict, I would say, a way of any innovation uh, being introduced into our group. 
um, I mean, the team is here who actually looks at this, but any innovation that comes is proposed to the group. Uh, we first um, do a proof of concept at the, at the teacher level. Uh, if there is a theoretical uh, approval, it would then go into uh, uh, not more than three to four schools across um, a geographical and socioeconomic background. Uh, so you would have not schools in Mumbai, but a Mumbai, uh, a Chalesgaon, a uh, Hassan, and uh, Patiala doing it simultaneously. We would then track that with data uh, against a control group twice a year, every year. We would then, if you are proved statistically significant in the first year, you get another four schools in the second year. And only then, over time, if you prove statistically significant in value addition, do you then get pushed across uh, more schools. So uh, to answer your question, we get a lot of uh, innovation proposals at the top level but who go through phase one and phase through, and we would actually implement not more than two a year, if proven significant across that period of time. Uh, so I mean, that's a, a control. You, do, you may miss out on a few things, but you would rather miss out on something, uh, not implement something uh, not proven, uh, because you're talking about education here, uh, then make a mistake on that front. And I'm sorry I didn't go to question two and three, uh, we'll, we can talk about that later. Good afternoon, Junior Achievement. Uh, Mr. Gaurav, from a management perspective, really wanted to understand one point from you. Brief context, we as well have been analyzing the cost structures of schools for various reasons. One of the reasons also is to see if we can start a K-12 school. And of course, the cost, and cost and economics are quite tough. So the specific question to you, Mr. Gaurav, is at the end of the day, you were going to fund even this event and the cost of this event from your core business, which is education. Uh, economics don't support this kind of events. Uh, what convinces you and how do you manage this? Uh, Mr. Venkat, it's a good question. Uh, we won't talk about the economics of it at the moment. Uh, but in terms of, I think that the, the core of your question is what's the driving force? Uh, why do we do what we do? Uh, I mean, and. Um, I mean, I'm standing where I am on the shoulders of people way before me. There's a saying that we are where we are because we're standing on the shoulders of giants. Uh, it, the first campus was started in 1927, way before me or my father. It was our great-grandfather. So uh, it has then passed on uh, uh, generationally to where we are today. Uh, but so I would say, uh, in one way, I've been uh, coming to the school management meeting since I was, uh, I think, in eighth grade. Uh, when I was so, uh, I've lived in that environment. I've uh, I've always been interested by it. It's a personal interest of mine. It's a personal, and of course, there's the other personal part of it, which you believe it's your, uh, it's a duty and it's a, a spiritual uh, position that you've been given to do. So I mean, there's a lot of factors for me personally, but I think as a whole, I think I'm speaking for everyone in this room. There's always going to be that. I mean. They're all high achievers here, yourself included. You could be working in a bank, you could be working in an IT industry, you could be working where I would argue that a lot of the, the returns monetarily could be higher. Uh, but at some level, it is that personal uh, calling or the personal decision that you take. And then you try and do the best that you can do within that environment. I hope that answers it. It's a very personal question. Thank you, sir. Uh, the last question here for this session, I'm so sorry, uh, would be uh, Sultan sir. Sultan sir is, as I mentioned earlier, the, he was the judge for our Young Change Agent Award. And I should, if I took part in a contest, he hosted. And I know most of you shouldn't care, but I should thank you very personally. I spent the next three years trying to speak exactly like him, then decided maybe I should do something else. But uh, always was inspiring. Thank you. Uh, this is more than a question. This is uh, a comment on the question of innovation, you said, and your response to it. Uh, Will you, you mentioned that innovation, if it can be scaled up and be adapted, it's a good one. I'm very worried about innovation in education when it is mindless. Because my statistics tells me today the fastest growing groups in this country, because uh, Mr. Podar, you talked about group schools growing are groups which call themselves techno-education. They have kids walking into school at 5, 5.30 in the morning and leaving at 7, 8 in the evening. They teach uh, IIT entrance and their regular courses together. You have no idea. In the past three years, 400 of them have started in South India. 
400. That is innovation, that is scale, but the question is, is that what you want in education? So uh, I, I don't know if that was a question, but I think we need to be very mindful when we talk about education and innovation. And I think that's a great segue to the rest of the, 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 the afternoon, where I think the educationalists will talk about more about uh, the, the specific innovations that uh, Mr. Ahmed just spoke about. But uh, thank you once again. Um, I hope that was helpful in any way. Uh, if there's any specifics, of course, please feel free to reach me. Thank you so much.